Hey, folks. So just a reminder, we are recording. Quick mic check. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Yep. Cool. Give it a few more moments for people to hop on, then we'll get started. Also, if we could get someone to share the agenda, that'd be fantastic. Great, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started. And uh, I see a couple people are filling out the agenda as we speak, so feel free to do that while we begin. So welcome to the uh, Network Service Mesh weekly meeting. So we have this meeting that occurs every, uh, every week on every, uh, every Tuesday at this time. We also have uh, before this uh, a uh, a meeting at uh, 4 a.m. Pacific time. Sorry, no, that's, that's the incorrect one. There is a uh, there is a version of this meeting. Do you remember the, the time that it's on? Uh, I think it's 10 a.m. Uh, uh, CET. Yeah, it's 10 a.m. CET, 8 a.m. GMT, if I recall correctly. It, um, it yeah. The, one other quick reminder to folks who are on the call, there is in the chat a link to go and add yourself as an attendee. So if you can go ahead and do that, that would be great. 
Yeah, and if we can if we can have someone share the agenda, that'd be great, so people can also follow along. Um, and check the um, check the meeting chat for the um, for the uh, location of the meeting notes where you can add your name down. So we have uh, we also participate in the CNCF Telecom User Group, and uh, that occurs every first Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific and every third Monday at 4 a.m. Pacific time. The Zoom is uh, is linked in the in the meeting notes here. We have the CNCF networking uh, working group. Um, I think those have been on hiatus for a moment, but I noticed uh, just today, this this morning, that there is now a CNCF networking SIG that is being uh, set up. So I think that's something we should probably uh, we should probably pay attention to. Well, that that's actually quite interesting. There had been a CNCF networking SIG, but it sort of wound down after a while and was not didn't have a whole lot going on there. So um, yeah, that, there, there's a brand new draft charter that I that I saw linked today. Oh, that's fantastic! So I have, I have not had time to read it because I just saw it uh, like ten minutes before this call. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's sitting there. I'll find the I'll find the link later on and I'll I'll add it on. Uh, major events. So we just finished up uh, ONS Europe, and so overall, I think it went fantastic. We had multiple talks. And uh, me and Taylor gave a uh, interview with Telecom User Group, and I also had an interview with uh, I forget the name of the uh, of the group, but there was a a person there named Swapnil, and I'll find the name of uh, of his particular group later on as well. So we had a lot of really good uh, of, of of really good uh, participation in in ONS, and there was a lot of excitement about it as well. And um, there was also some interesting news from Dan Cohn. Uh, Taylor, um, are, are you on the call? I am. Are you able to uh, state what uh, Dan Cohn mentioned up on his keynote? Sure. Um, so uh, you're referring to the CNF test bed and kind of uh, where we could go potentially? Yeah, since we're talking about ONS and uh, in this particular one, can you uh, can you just give like a quick blurb on on what was mentioned? Yeah, so um, we've uh, it was kind of talking about where we could go with the CNF test bed, and which is um, adding on to the roadmap, which folks may have, may or may not have seen. But we ended up doing a tutorial uh, based on where we are now in the CNF testbed, which dealt with how you could reproduce um, the environment as well as running different use cases. Someone is sharing their screen and um, they're not sharing the, the dock anymore. Um, so we, we dug into that some and, and the tutorial was based around what we're um, what we have now, and we're moving um, towards kind of the next version of the test bed. And, and what Dan had mentioned was potentially using it as a dev uh, platform as one portion. So folks could do development on whether it's network functions or use cases, um, different things. This expands on where we've already gone. Um, so this is a, a good path. There's a lot of folks that are already using it for some of this. And uh, make sure that we get enough feedback to make that useful for more people. And then the other part was around certification, um, how we would um, be able to run certification and testing for um, to see if, if, if whether your technology or the network functions or whatever are following uh, cloud native principles and what does that mean? So those are the two main things, development platform and, and working with some type of certification, being able to run the certification test. Cool, thank you, Taylor. Yeah, yeah there was um, definitely some interest in uh, the CNTT meeting after ONS as well in this particular area. Uh, it, it would be just uh, some feedback for you. So it'd be good to make sure that the messaging on, on what you're trying to certify 
is uh, is very clear because if it's going to be an end-to-end -end certification process, we'll get a lot of pushback. But if we make it clear that it's just specifically for CNF best practices and principles, then I think we can get some really good uh, uh, we, we can get some really good uh, uh, traction there. Cool. Um, we have a CNCF webinar series that's going to go on tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So uh, that'll be between uh, me, Ed, and Nikolai. Uh, I think the, is, is it just us three? Is, is there anyone else going to be involved? I think it's just the three of us. Um, yeah, and we've got a ton of interesting stuff to talk about there. Um, so yeah, it should be quite a good quite a good time. Yeah, and there's a brand new slide deck uh, attached to that as well with some really fantastic information. So we'll make sure that that gets uh, posted around. We have Open Source Summit coming up in Lyon with an intro to NSM by Ivana and Radoslav. And that'll be on October 28th through 30th. We have November 18th through 21st, we have KubeCon North America occurring in San Diego with NSMCon. So um, have we posted the agenda yet on that? Yes, we actually have. Hang on. Uh, let me. If someone could go and grab the, the schedule and, and paste it in. There we go. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that is a going thing now. Uh, so thank you to all who submitted talks. They, we had a lot of excellent talks submitted. Um, it was great fun going through the selection process. So, so we have that coming up in uh, the first, uh, I guess the first day of KubeCon or the right day of before KubeCon, depending on your perspective. Um, and finally, there is a Kubernetes forum. Did, did anyone submit anything to the Kubernetes forum for yeah. either Seoul or Sydney? Uh, no, but there's one other thing I do want to say about NSMCon, which is make sure you register. Uh, it's filling up fast. Oh, yes, definitely. Make sure, make sure you register. Um, that, that is true. So we, we have limited, uh, we have limited space as well. So that's going to, uh, you, you risk not being able to get in if you don't register now. Yeah. Um, if you've already registered for KubeCon in your registration email, there's a, there should be a link or a reference number you can use in order to, in order to add it on. Okay. And, uh, with that, we, um, uh, back to the question, do we have, do we get any, uh, talks or, uh, submissions in for the Seoul or Sydney? I don't think so. Does anyone know of any? So considering the CFP is already closed, um, you know, as, as interesting as the information will be inside of it, uh, I think we should probably remove this. Yeah, I think so too. There we go. God knows we have enough events cool. to work with already. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> and um, yeah, we have. Uh, so with that, we have the uh, social media community team. So uh, Lucina, you have the floor. Hi. Good day. Great. Um, so last week we were at Open Networking Summit in Antwerp, Belgium, and gained 19 followers on the N Service Mesh Twitter account followed 48 folks and tweeted and retweet almost 70 uh, new posts. I posted about the webinar happening tomorrow, the NSMCon schedule, reminder of today's um, two calls, the bi-weekly call and the weekly call, and posted reminders and photos from the ONS talks. And my plan for this week is to send another reminder for tomorrow's webinar and promote individual sessions and speakers for Network Service MeshCon, promote the sessions at KubeCon, I'll send a reminder to register to NSMCon, um, and a call for sponsors, and to thank and promote any existing sponsors, and then promote those sessions at Open Source Summit in Lyon. Are there any other um, items that you would like to see shared on N Service Mesh Twitter? Yeah, I, that's what comes immediately to mind for me. Um, but I mean, we're still growing 5% week on week, which is insanely good. 
in terms of number of followers. I just want to call that out because we're just killing it on, on social. So thank you so much, Lucina. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, I can't think of anything else at this particular point. Um, once, uh, once the interviews end up being posted on um, uh, between Taylor and me, uh, then we'll we can share those out. But I don't know when those are going to be posted because I noticed that the ONS uh, North America ones seem to trickle out between June and July. So there might be a little bit of time before they pop out. Do we know if we're going to have wow. any videos from ONSCU that we can point people to? No. Unfortunately, I did not see any video recording equipment with the exception of the panel. Okay. And oh. So the press, the, um, the only thing that I'm seeing is the, the I guess the keynotes. Those have been released. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know of anything else like Frederick is saying. Okay. Yeah, there de definitely was not recording equipment in the rooms that I was in with the exception of the, of the panel. So they had, um, the panel that uh, Taylor and I were on, I, I recall seeing a uh, video recorder there. There is a playlist that's out for the keynotes. I didn't look through the entire list to see if the panel was on that, but it's possible, uh, Frederick, that it's already there if, if that was released um, at the same time. Yeah, what they did last year was that the sessions that were recorded, they stuck them behind a paywall and gave access to attendees. So uh, we may not be able to share it out publicly, even if it's, even if they do stick it up somewhere. But uh, hmm. I think what we should do is we should probably reach out to um, to LFN if they do that and ask them if they'll make an exception on this one. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that we wanted to, I'm, I'm not sure I see it in the list here, uh, we are supposed to have a, a committer's uh, like interview or webinar, I don't know what it is. Ed? Uh, oh, do you mean the podcast for the contributors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I okay. don't know when that's going to broadcast yet. I think we're trying to record it in the middle of October. Yeah, uh, and I'm not sure exactly when it will be broadcast, but there, there is a uh, the the folks who do the Cloud Native podcast um, are starting a new podcast that's called the Contributors, um, and so they are, um, yes, yeah, so they're 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 interviewing us uh, for that in the middle of October, and hopefully that will come out before KubeCon. So cool. Cool. Is there uh, anything else that we want to talk about in terms of uh, social media stuff, or should we move on? Okay, with that, uh, let's talk about uh, Circle CI. Yeah, so if you, anybody has pushed patches this morning or been looking at patches that have come in this morning, Circle CI is currently having an issue and is broken. This is purely a Circle CI problem, but in, in Typical fashion, they are right on top of it. So they've already been in communication with me to let me know that they're getting, working on getting it fixed. So we expect that to resolve uh, pretty quickly. And like anything else, every system has a failure rate, you know, but they've been really, really good about, um, you know, you closing the loop quickly. So I hope to have that back up shortly. Cool. Sounds like uh, they're engaged, and so let's make sure that we have something in place so that we can retrigger builds that need to be retriggered. Um, other than that, um, feedback from Asia community call. So Nikolai, I believe you were running that one. So yeah, uh, we don't have any like uh, China time zone, you know, Asia time zone turn up uh, this morning. So we used it to go through some uh, internal um, topics, um, mostly so the, I left just before the end, so I don't know how, how it continued, but uh, in the beginning we went quickly with Andre through, through some things, then we spent a lot of time with Ilya on uh, restructuring the make, make file system uh, and these new ideas that are there, uh, his PR, 
Uh, and then uh, Matt came up with a couple of questions and updates, uh, which Matt, if you're, ah, yeah, you're, you're here, maybe, maybe you want to tell your updates, what you're doing with Michael. Uh, oh, uh, yes, uh, we have been working with Michael about uh, the capabilities to uh, inject uh, physical NIX. The, he's doing so uh, in the CNF testbed. And I've been testing it, and uh, and we are discussing how we can um, uh, leverage the the device plugin uh, framework to be able to overcome some uh, some uh, VPP DPDK uh, issues. Because for now, uh, if you if you uh, use some uh, VFIO uh, devices, uh, each uh, container has to run privileged and see all the FIO devices. So no, I, I, I know that we've solved that in the past. Um, mm. So, and I, I don't know what's going on currently in the SRIOV DPD uh, device plugin, but there, there's, a, there's a chunk of extremely old code that's probably not directly usable except as reading material called okay. the SRIOV controller. And yeah. I know for a fact that 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 code had been run and injected into an unprivileged pod everything necessary for a user space program to run unprivileged an unprivileged pod to pick up that VF and use it. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there's also a set of issues with DPDK. Please note this was a year ago, so I don't know if they, if they were talking about fixing them, they may have. But when I last looked at it, there were a set of issues with DPDK whereby if it did not find its, if it did not find itself in the NUMA zone it wanted, able to get all the huge pages it wanted, and able to get exactly what it wanted, it would just crash. Yeah. Um, now, with a, with a really pointed log message, so it's not like an unorderly crash. It'd say, "I can't help you. I'm done." Um, okay. But that was a DPDK thing, not an SRIO VVF thing. Okay. Um, That's uh, the, the the VF pod works even with like unprivileged containers. Um, I think the issue I'm seeing right now is that VPP just doesn't want to start when it's not running privileged, um, and it's both due to huge pages and the um, kernel module for VFIO PCI. Okay. So 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 the, the device plugin itself works, but it just doesn't work well with the uh, VPP or DPDK. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I can if we can figure out whether it's VPP or DPDK at this point. Um, I can try and point the right folks at it from both sides um, because I, I think it's all in our all in everyone's interest to get this resolved. Um, yeah. But I think right now it's probably mainly VPP since VPP is doing some parsing, and if it fails, then it either crashes or it just goes through like a, a default where it doesn't really care about the devices and just fetches everything. If you can, if you can gather that stuff up, I can probably get someone to go take a look at it. Sure, um, sure. So. Um, no, but that, that sounds great, Matthew. Um, you guys are doing amazing work, and that, that's super neat stuff. OK, uh, and the other issue we are, we are talking about this morning was uh, another VPP issue about the metrics. Ivana, you are aware of, of what, uh, what's happening yeah. here? Yes, I was just going to raise that. Matt, you asked us in the morning about the VPP metrics, and I checked the issue in the legato repo. So, uh, they agreed, uh, if fetch remembers, you ask them, they agreed uh, that they will send metrics uh, with the VPP agent, but uh, make them configurable. And uh, currently there is no movement on this issue. So I think if we want to prioritize, that it's not priority for them. So maybe if it's priority for us, we should move it forward. Uh, let, me, let me also check and see where that stands with them, um, because I know those guys pretty well, and I talked to them, and they were they they said they would get it done, but they're also like you know how some people just don't talk very much. Um, <laughs> we we have this marvelous word in English for this called taciturn. All right, it's how you describe someone who just doesn't really say much, um, and they tend to be taciturn people. The guys working on BPP agents, so they could be busily working on things, and it didn't occur to them to tell us. Um, so I will definitely check in with them. Yeah, and telling more about metrics observability. Uh, as last week, I was more focused on the ONS demo, where unfortunately I couldn't uh, attend uh, for some issues the conference. But uh, 
but the PRs are not uh, yet updated. And uh, I, I will be able to update them at the end of the week because we have another conference and the Prometheus PR and the other PR for exposing pod names. These are the two that are required for the metrics observability and yeah, I, I need to update them with latest master and test with master. Okay. Yeah, and, and feel free to reach out to I am. You, you, we've, we've gone multi-module since then, since you probably have last updated those, um, which isn't hard, but if you bump into anything, it's probably the fastest thing to do is to, is to ask, so. Uh, I was having another question related to, uh, to uh, the Open Networking Summit. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, attend uh, the, the summit. But uh, I don't know if you had some uh, contact with uh, VNF vendors interested in uh, leveraging the, the NSM uh, framework. Which, uh, which group was it? No, uh, not, uh, not uh, specific VNF vendors, but in general, uh, did, did you have contact with a with VNF vendor interested? Yeah, I apologize. It's, it's coming across a little bit uh, poor quality on my side. Uh, so the question is, do we have contacts with some VNF vendors? Yeah, because the summit is a place to, to discuss with them. And uh, uh, I'm interested in, uh, in having a, a proof of concept with, uh, with, uh, with uh, VNF vendors, uh, 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 VNFs. So uh, at least from... If I, if I might take this, uh, Fred, maybe maybe you, you have uh, a lot more to add, or I don't know, maybe something some things are not to be discussed sure, publicly, okay. but uh, uh, so uh, I, I was, uh, I think much I told you today, uh, this call, but it's probably worth also to talking about this now. So uh, I was at the talk where uh, some guy had developed uh, his own framework to simulate large uh, networks. Uh, his demo was based on um, uh, Quagga, essentially, running uh, a mesh of Quaggas, like 750 Quaggas meshed uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, he recently actually joined our channels. So I spoke to him and he agreed that we might try to figure out something that can be uh, done in our examples repo that can re re replicate similar things. And uh, the other thing that uh, uh, happened at uh, okay, I forgot what it was. There was something else. Rauslav, do you remember? Mm, I'm not, not sure. So about running some something in the CNS. Yeah, okay, I, it, it slipped my mind. So Fred, if you, if you have something that you can tell. Yeah. So out of the ones that I that I recall, so um, I feel like the number of VNF vendors that were there was not as high as it would be within like the North America one. So I mean, you had some of the larger companies that has their that has a lot of uh, of pull in from from a variety of places like you know Ericsson and and similar. Uh, and I did have some conversations with uh, with uh, with them. Um, uh, interestingly, though, the the most most of the people I ended up talking with uh, in when I went to the CNTT event were primarily people from the uh, from the operator side. So, uh, so the operators are definitely uh, are definitely interested. But uh, yeah, I, I felt that the participation from the NF vendors, to at least from from my perspective, seemed to be uh, seemed to be lower than usual. So that's which limits some of the conversations there. Mm -hmm. I just remembered what I, what I wanted to say. So uh, Taylor is here on the call and Michael and other uh, participants that are, that are doing uh, uh, this wonderful CNF testbed. So uh, on, the, on the roadmap for CNF testbed is an interesting demo with uh, kind of 5G gateway, GSM 5G gateway. Uh, and I don't know if there are specific plans, but I would assume something probably based on porting OMEC on top or something like that. So, if guys are interested in this, probably we can try to form some form of uh, uh, special interest group <laughs> and try to push this through. I don't know. 
But to me, Omec is a uh, 4G only. It's not 5G uh, core company. Ah, okay, okay. I didn't know that. Uh, I'm not totally sure, but some colleagues told me that. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is for it is 4G only, but it has like uh, that uh, uh, CPDP split. So uh, in a way, uh, you 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 have like a UPF functionality there, right? So it's it's like in transition kind of a gateway. Uh, Mathieu, um, that's Dan from Bell. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't done the discussion that was I was not at ONS last time, but from my conversation with a lot of the VNF vendors we currently use right now, my guess feeling is they're not even at the discussion of should we use an SM or not. They're just trying to figure out how the heck do we containerize or make our application cloud native and how do we sell them to us? Yeah. And that's the resounding sound I've seen right now is that, and that's part of, I think, why the telco user group and the, the white papers are need to be happening faster than we talk we think about is because that's where the day the, we have a kind of an architecture around this and people start building code to do those things, then it actually makes it more prevalent. Why should we use network service mesh or not? Right now, the, I think yeah, they're yeah. not level yet. Yeah, that's exactly my feeling on it as well. Like um, one of the things that I mentioned in the CNTT group for the people that are there was um, like there was a lot of a lot of talk that was centered around how do we containerize this? How do we containerize that? And uh, so one of the things that I uh, brought up was to keep in mind that containerization and cloud natification are two different things, and that they need to talk about them as separate things. Where except for cloud natification requires a good containerization story, so they have to get that side of correct on the infrastructure first. But uh, when they engage with the with the vendors and they start talking about, uh, they like to push their requirements. And so when they talk about the requirements, that's something that uh, that I'm hoping that we can get them to do is to add in the uh, the various principles of cloud native um, network functions that um, that we can help drive that particular uh, that particular part of the industry for it. But I think in the beginning, we're going to see a lot of lift and shift. And that may be okay for, for some things, but, you know, it's definitely something we're going to have to, that we're going to have to educate and help, um, and help guide people on. So in one of my conversations, I don't remember where it was, but someone told me, yeah, there is this tool that you just throw a VM at it and then it gets you a container, like extracts everything and then runs. And uh, as you can imagine, the, essentially the contents of this virtual machine came from just recompiling more or less, you know, the bare metal images of what did exist. So <laughs> it kind of starts to creep in <laughs> into the cloud native world, if you think about it. So I don't know, maybe. Oh yeah, just wait till you start adding things like Kubernetes into it as well. Like people say, well, it runs in a VM controlled by Kubernetes. And so, uh, but they don't gain the benefits of Kubernetes beyond a couple uh, beyond a couple minor areas. So it's uh, we definitely have our work cut out uh, for us in this education process. Yeah, I mean the other thing you run into is that the, these tools that convert VMs into containers, um, they're only really operating at the level of user space. So in addition to all the inefficiency that comes from the conversion, because you get these giant containers, if you have anything going on that actually involves like KLMs which most, most VNFs do these days, um, then it will not work for that purpose. So is, is there anything else that we wanna talk about on this or should we uh, jump back to the agenda? Cool, um, let's talk about uh, buzzing. Uh, Sorry, buzzing I was, uh, Frederick. I was muted I trying to respond. This Taylor, um, if we do have network functions that we can define whether one was the mention was a 4G type of network function versus 5G, I think it would be useful to have the functionality um, and the specifics of how you would test it from the outside if we can get all of that defined. And that's helpful along this path. 
Um, we're going to keep educating people on all the principles and stuff and, and then how you could implement those using something, using network service mesh or whatever. Um, but along with that, just having examples of code, we've, we've been lacking on that side. So wh what, what do people actually want? And we didn't get a lot of feedback as mentioned from uh, vendors on the specific network functions for whatever reasons. Um, we did get a little bit at ONS though from operators, um, including a one from Swisscom uh, that we'll probably be talking about after getting a little bit more feedback next time. But if, if you have specific network functions that you can point out and go, we can't release it because it's proprietary, but we can we can spe uh, give the specs on how it should work and the functionality. Uh, we could end up writing end-to-end -end tests and re-implement it ourselves. Yeah, that's definitely an option. I and mean, my my preference would definitely be to get the vendors to to jump in and buy in and uh, help us with writing those tests out. But I mean, that that is definitely an option that we that we have is to try to work out what, uh, where we think things are going to be going and what, uh, what's considered to be of high value and just help defining what that particular path would be. So that, that, is, that is definitely an option. Um, do you think that that would be a good area to drive through the, through the telco user group? I do. I think, yeah, I agree. I, I think um, it, it is a good place to get a lot of feedback and and then from there, it can go to other projects. So maybe Network Service Mesh says, okay, we um, see what y'all are trying to do. We're going to implement some functionality to support that. And then on the CNF testbed side, okay, we're going to um, create an example with different pieces that are available um, and so on. But it, it'd give a place to talk and then and go out to all the other projects. And probably yeah, have um, it'll be it, it'd be I would think that we could get to usable documentation papers uh, paper, uh, than the white paper. Uh, the white paper is trying to cover so much, and I think that's why it's it's been a lot harder. But if we can get something smaller like this, get people to jump in from vendors and their experience and the operators and what they've been saying. Um, we could generate those and may, maybe have a specs, spec documents or something. Cool. So I, I would like to sort of move on. I got a bunch of other stuff on the agenda to go through today. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about this uh, later on as well. Uh, we, we can discuss in private how to okay. how to engage. Um, great. So uh, fuzzing bugs. Yeah, so just a, a quick note, um, we've been getting some fuzzing bugs. Some folks from the fuzzing community showed up and have been kind enough to run some fuzzing testing. And so um, as they've been finding things, we've been adding uh, bugs for them. These happen to be an amazing place to start if you're in Kubernetes because, I'm sorry, if you're in, in network service mesh and wanting to pick up a shovel and do some work, um, because effectively at the end of the day, they're really easy bugs to fix. Um, and so I wanted to be, draw people's attention to them. Could be an excellent opportunity to get your first commit into NSM if you haven't done so already. Absolutely. So. Cool. So the links are in the agenda. Um, with that, uh, status of the project. So let's jump straight into that. Yeah, I, I wanted to have a brief discussion about API stuff um, just so that we can socialize some of this a little bit and get input. Uh, so I've actually got a separate deck for this because in talking to Nikolai this morning, he suggested that I draw pictures. Um, and you know what happens when you ask me to draw pictures. <laughs> Should I be sorry already? <laughs> <laughs> this uh, deck is 90 slides. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was rushed for time this morning, so not quite. Uh, so basically, okay, 45. talking yes. currently about the current state of things. So we have this remote a local API split. We have you know, the, the remote network service mesh and the local network service mesh API. We have remote connections and local connections. We have remote mechanisms and local mechanisms. We have remote monitor connection and local monitor connection. And this was 
done for relatively straightforward reasons in the early days of network service mesh, but it turns out that having two APIs for everything, even that are very similar, is actually creating a bunch of internal headaches, trying to make the total system simpler and easier to maintain for people. Um, and I think we figured out a better way of doing it. So just to sort of drive through the particulars so you can see how much they're the same, this is side by side the remote network service mesh and the local network service mesh. And literally, other than the fact you're talking about local versus remote mechanisms, they are exactly the same API. When you look at connections, they're very, very similar. The only differences are for remote connections. We talk about the source network uh, service manager, the destination network service manager, and the network service endpoint name. Um, and it turns out we've already got people asking us to get the network service endpoint name into the local API as well. So these are very, very close. Um, the mechanisms, right? So remote mechanisms and local mechanisms. Structurally, they're identical. The only difference was the enum types. And we already have a, an issue out requesting that we change from enums to strings for mechanism type in order to allow for easier extensibility. And then for the monitor connection, likewise, they both got connection events types that are the same. The connection events are structurally the same. The um, monitor connection call differs only in whether you have a scope selector, where the scope selector lets you say whether you're wanting the, you know, basically the, the source and destination end of what connections you're interested in. And so these are incredibly alike, and it's creating all kinds of complications inside the implementations to have them be separate at this time. Um, and so as we're doing a lot of refactoring, the idea came up to bring them together. And so the proposed state is that we do this. We take the local and remote versions of these and we unify them. So instead of having local and remote network service APIs, we just have the network service API. Same with connection, same with mechanism, same with monitor connection. And to give you some idea of what that would look like, in the case of the network service, where the two APIs are basically the same other than the local and the remote part, uh, you just end up with a network service that is structurally the same, only you're dealing with unified things. For the unified connection object, essentially, you know, you've got the remote and the local. The only difference is you bring those together as a single connection where rather than having um, the source network service manager and the destination service ma network service manager, we just have an ordered list of network service managers. Um, this gives us a little bit more extensibility. And then um, you have the network service endpoint name, which people already wanted for the local connection anyway. And then on the mechanism types, people had already requested that we move to using a string type to improve extensibility, because there were people wanting to be able to add mechanisms without necessarily having to update the enum. Um, and so with the mechanisms, what we've really done is to make this all doable is we added a class to the mechanism, that class being either remote or local. The reason the name here is CLS instead of class is because um, all kinds of comedy ensues in languages like Java if you try and use class as a, as a variable name. Um, but effectively, this is either remote or local. And this way, we can tell the difference between the mechanisms we're dealing with because you should be able to tell the difference. But um, you don't have to have two separate objects for them anymore. Any questions so far? Okay. And then, yeah, go ahead. No, I was saying, no, it's, it's clear. I think. And then for the monitor connection, uh, where we had the remote and the local, we would unify those down to a single connection monitor. Um, where we would simply have everything have a monitor scope selection and have a repeated list of network service managers, just like we went to a repeated list of network service managers in the um, network service request um, for, you know, for flexibility, and then everything comes in with a monitor scope selector. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is we effectively um, halved our API um, with these particular changes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then obviously there has to be a transition plan for the shift. And so the thinking was that we go ahead and create adapters for the servers 
so that we can switch over to the new API and simply wrap the original server code um, rather than having to try and work, rework all the code at once. And then anywhere in the original server that we're using clients, and this is true for either network service endpoints or network service managers, we have an adapter for the client. So the original code, if it thinks it's calling a local client for the network service management API, um, it just, instead of instantiating that from one place, it instantiates it from a compatibility library. And that ends up wrapping the unified uh, client call when making the call to the, the out. And so in this way, the original server code only changes in using the client adapters internally at first, and we wrap them around, around them in the service adapter. And then we can, at our leisure, pull the pieces out of the original servers into things that use the unified API in order to complete the transition. This should let us switch to the new API fairly quickly um, and then do the transition in a more leisurely fashion so we don't get giant PRs that change everything all at once. And to give you some idea of how that flow would go, you know, essentially the stuff that comes in now to any of the servers would be the unified API. It would get converted to either local or remote coming in because we do have that mechanism class to be able to tell. That then calls whatever the original code was in the network service manager or network service endpoint, which does whatever internal processing it was doing before. Uh, it then makes its call out via whatever clients it's making which goes to the client adapters, they convert to the unified API and they use the unified API going out. And so this should allow us to do a fairly quick transition and then deprecate the old API on the internal, old original internal code um, as quickly as it happens to go, but it doesn't have to happen in one piece. It can happen step by step in small pieces. So I wanted to sort of come here, talk to you guys about it, see what people's opinions were, um, socialize this, et cetera, so that we could have a discussion about it before we sort of proceeded. I think the one thing we need to do is um, to make sure that uh, any groups who have been trying to build things on top of NSM, that we just give them a heads up. Uh, and the only one I can think of is probably uh, Lumina. Um, I know that they've been working with NSM for, for a bit now. Yeah, if we could, uh, if Prem, uh, Prem and, company. Yeah, if we could let them know, and, and, you know, and anyone else you know of who's building things on top of NSM, please let them know. Um, this, you know, effectively, you know, uh, the part of why the deck is here is to sort of help explain what's going on. There's also in the meeting minutes a link to the PR. Um, or that, that's actually working on the new API if you want to sort of see the blocking and tackling. It also has the start on the converters and adapters as well. Um, but yeah, I do let them know this is happening. But the, one of the reasons that I'd like to get this done, um, if folks think it's a good idea fairly expeditiously is the, the more time passes, the more people will be building things on network service mesh. And so, you know, we don't want to have, it's better to switch the API like this sooner rather than later. Yeah, I completely agree, especially as we do the march to the 1.0 release. And so I think right now is the perfect time to do it. Uh, yep. And yeah, we, we just go and get it done. Like th this has a, a series of other really nice, uh, um, a really nice properties so that once once we start to bring in things like uh, multiple multiple data planes at the same time, where like you could have VPP as a data plane, your SROV uh, thing can be a, its own data plane, or maybe you have something that controls an esoteric tunnel type that's not supported by your by your common infrastructure. So it, it it'll help with like the dynamic uh, selection of these type of uh, these type of things, and so this API change really helps simplify that entire that entire process. Yeah. Um, with that, um, is there anything else that we want to talk about on the API discussion? Well, uh, we have a few things that landed uh, recently. Uh, Ed, do you want to continue? We have about 10 more minutes. Sure, so I'll let Ilya say a few words about the Spiffy Spire stuff that just recently landed. Uh, that, that's been coming for quite some time, so it was, it was good to get that in. Oh, yes, uh, now it's in. 
and sometimes it has some troubles, especially locally, and guys from sort reported to me. So if you have such troubles, just I think me in Slack. And but uh, I think now it's already better. It had troubles with kind, but we fix it. So. Yep. Yeah, on so, CI, I don't see any problems with Spire. Okay. Yeah, so we, we did hit an issue with Kind that turned out to be an interaction between Kind and Spire. Uh, and so we currently in the repo, it's it's the Spire stuff is off by default. But I think if we, we, we have a fix, we should probably look at re-enabling it by default because we do want to move to a stance where we're secure by default. The other thing that came in was a comment on one of the PRs from someone who said that they were having some issues with the interaction between Spire and, and non-Docker CRIs. Um, so I, I'm trying to find out what CRI they're playing with and, and what's going on. So, but they, they, they're comfortable, they have a workaround so they can, they're not blocked, but we obviously want to make sure we work in general. So just just a quick uh, kind of uh, overview. This security is not on the data path. Like it's not uh, kind of uh, we're not encrypting the links between the the different posts that we establish that we maintain. It's on, on the G gRPC level where uh, the clients and endpoints talk to network service manager. Yep, it's the it's the gRPC level exactly as you said. It's the it's effectively mm -hmm. an NSM's version of the control plane. Um, just to make sure, for example, that you know who asked to connect to your network service uh, so that as a result, you can decide whether you want to let them connect to your network service. Um, or if you're a client and someone says, has come back and said, hey, I, you know, I've given you the network service, um, you can decide whether that's someone you trust to give you the network service and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it's completely optional. You can turn it on and off depending on your use case. Of course, we want to move to a model where by default it's on, but Still, you have the option to. to yep, yep. You absolutely have the option to turn it off, um, and you know, hopefully, we'll transition uh, relatively quickly from it being default off to being default on. Mm -hmm. Good. Cool. Um, the other thing that landed, and this was mostly Artem, was a switch to a multi-module main repo, um, and this essentially came about because for those of you who've been following along at home, have probably noticed that the main network service mesh repo, uh, repo, while it's not very large from the point of view of number of lines of code, um, it's gotten really bloated thematically. The number of different things that live in the main repo is kind of large, and there, there is a desire to try and break this up into sub repos over time. And sort of the first step for that was to have multi-modules in the main repo. Um, this also helps a lot for people developing network service endpoints because it means that you only have to depend on the bits that the SDK itself actually depends on. You don't end up pulling through like all the Kubernetes dependencies that are only used in the K8s directory, for example. Uh, that, uh, I mean, if someone wants to see a demonstration of how this works in the examples repo, I mean, uh, it did a set of patches to migrate to this new uh, model. And uh, one can clearly see how the dependencies are not each and everything in the world, but just whatever, whatever is needed there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was, that was fun. Um, cool. And then the last one on the various SDK updates, um, this was something that I've been doing. I've been doing little tiny cleanups and, um, <clears throat> I noticed when looking at Jaeger that they have this thing where for the Jaeger configuration, you can simply call from ENV and it will generate a Jaeger configuration object from the environment. And then you can pass it on down the line. And we had been using an NS complete call, which was, and so switched to having something that was a little bit more conventionally named. Um, but then the other one is to have the configuration passed in um, at the top uh, instead of completing somewhere in the middle. Um, seem to make a lot of make things a lot clearer as to where various values were coming from and sort of how things were flowing through. Oh, so we have 
about three to four minutes for the in-progress stuff. Is there anything that we want to call out on that, or should we uh, punt that uh, and revisit it next week? I would be okay revisiting next week. Much of this stuff is stuff that's been in progress for some time. Uh, um, I would, I would, I would like a quick update. I didn't know that this thing exists. Uh, what is the Ethernet context story? Oh, so this was a response to a bug that we found for AutoHeal. And the bug was that when we were testing AutoHeal, um, we would start getting, we would get a few ping failures on AutoHeal. And what oh. it turned out to be was it was an ARP issue. So basically when you AutoHealed, you were getting reconnected to somebody who had a different ethernet MAC address on their, um, had a different MAC address on their end of the connection, right? Because you just reconnected to them. And so you had a, and now you have an incorrect ARP entry in your ARP cache. And so the, the, the way that we're looking at fixing that is to add to the connection context, just like we have an IP context and a DNS context, to add an ethernet context so that when you go to auto heal, you can say, look, I'm, I'm auto healing. The guy on the other end of this connection I'm auto healing is going to expect you to have this MAC address over here. Could you please have that? Does that make sense? Yep, yep, it does. I was, I was, I was thinking something along the lines. If you remember, like I don't know, two calls back or three calls back, we we're discussing that today uh, IPs are more or less mandatory in the way that we have our API implemented. Uh, but yeah, that's probably something that that has to be tackled separately. Okay. Well, I mean, like they're they're definitely not mandatory at the level of the API, and if they're uh, yeah. if they're oh, okay. showing up as mandatory at the level of the data planes, we need to fix that. Uh, um, yeah, I think it's it's the data planes or the forwarders that actually. Uh, okay, uh, we, we we definitely need to fix that if the forwarders are requiring it because they shouldn't be. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's another thing if we happen to have very heavily encouraged that kind of behavior with our SDK. But you, you, just as you observed, you need to be able to run without um, an IP context, just yep. like we also need to be able to run without an Ethernet context, frankly. Um, so, because you, 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 you're, there are definitely use cases where you actually don't want IPAM um, happening. So, cool. Great. Well, I think we've hit the uh, the end of our useful uh, time in this particular meeting. So, um, is there any last call outs anyone wants to say in the last minute or two? Okay. I'll make one call out then. Mm -hmm. I've added the CNCF SIG network charter that's being worked on to the um, to the uh, to the list or to the to the agenda near near the top. Um, the document is dated in April 2019, but there seems to be quite a few people looking at it right now because of the email they just sent. Um, and it was written by Lee Calcott with uh, contributions by Matt Klein and Ken Owens. Uh, and we'll leave it at that and uh, revisit the stuff next week. Uh, anyways, uh, thank you all for your time, and we'll see you again at the same time here next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers, bye.